Thank you for the introduction. I'm excited to be here today. I'll be talking about hereditary breast cancer genetics in 2019. So I have no conflicts of interest. So I thought it would be important to kind of start with defining some basic genetic terms. So hereditary cancer syndromes occur when an individual inherits a genetic mutation that predisposes them to develop cancer. So this can be caused by a germline or a hereditary mutation. Germline and hereditary mutations are mutations in genes that are passed on from parents to offspring. This is in contrast to somatic mutations. So somatic mutations are mutations that are acquired by any cell in the body after birth and are not inherited or passed to offspring. And these mutations are often detected in tumors and are an, an area of interest to developing new therapeutics to treat cancer. So today in 2019, there's about 10 hereditary breast cancer genes. They include ATM, BRCA1, BRCA2, CDH1, CHECK2, NBN, NF1, PALB2, STIC11, and TP53. And so these cancer genes are inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. This basically means that if an individual's mother or father has a hereditary cancer gene, that the, then the individual has a 50% chance of having that gene too. So clinical cancer genetics is a relatively young field. So clinical cancer, um, so hereditary cancer syndromes were probably first described in 1895 by Dr. Worthen at the University of Michigan. However, it wasn't until the 1960s and the 1970s that Henry Lynch, who was a physician, really described the first cancer genetic syndromes in the medical literature. He also established the family tree as a clinical tool. So this is an example of one of the family trees. And in the family pedigrees, circles represent women, squares represent men, and um, there's notation indicating when people are diagnosed with cancer, what type of cancer, and what age. So in this example, this is a family that has a BRCA1 mutation. You see there's a woman who was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 30. She's now age 31, so that's um, annotated in the family pedigree. And her mother had ovarian cancer at age 44 and died at age 46. So when we collect this information in the clinic, this is a family where we would recommend cancer genetic testing. So with along with the kind of clinical description of hereditary cancer syndromes, there was a lot of cancer gene discoveries between the late 1970s until 2000s, and this includes the discovery of TP53. TP53 is a gene that's associated with breast cancer, leukemia, and sarcoma. And then the BRCA1 and 2 genes were identified and cloned in the 1990s. So, Along with the cancer gene discoveries, there was a lot of um, debate in the legal setting about how this information was going to be um, kind of analyzed. So in 1996, Myriad launched the first analysis that was available as a commercial analysis for BRCA1 and 2. They also patented that gene. So there was a lot of debate of whether genetic information could be patented, and it wasn't until 2013 that the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that a naturally occurring DNA segment is a product of nature and not patent eligible. So this invalidated Myriad's patent on BRCA1 and 2, and as a result, a lot of new commercial clinical testing became a variant available. So now, um, in my clinic, we use Invite, Color, Myriad, GeneDX, and Ambry for clinical testing. There's also um, direct-to-consumer testing, and 23andMe does direct-to-consumer testing for three BRCA mutations, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So with all of these kind of advancements, there's also been individuals like Angelina Jolie who has brought a lot of awareness to hereditary cancer syndromes. And part of this has made people more aware that they could be at risk for a hereditary, hereditary cancer syndrome. 
and to have more people consider testing. She has also helped, I think, to destigmatize having a woman's cancer and having uh, a cancer genetic syndrome. So she has had an impact. So in 2019, who should have germline testing? So we currently test anyone who meets NCCN guideline criteria. And ideally, we test individuals who have had cancer first. So I'm not planning to go through the NCCN guideline criteria because it's a little bit complicated about number of first degree and number of second degree relatives with different cancers. But in general, um, if an individual has a family history of breast, ovarian, pancreatic, prostate, actually any cancer, we will consider um, germline genetic testing. So we also test anyone with breast cancer who has a family history of breast, ovarian, fallopian tube, peritoneal, pancreatic, or prostate cancer. We also test anyone diagnosed with breast cancer at a young age, anyone with triple negative breast cancer, because we know triple negative breast cancer is more strongly associated with BRCA1 and 2. And we test any men diagnosed with breast cancer, because that could be an indicator that they have BRCA1 and 2. And we also test individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage if they have a breast cancer diagnosis, a personal history of ovarian or pancreatic cancer. And the latest kind of trend in our practice is to test patients with metastatic breast cancer. And this is because if we identify patients who have BRCA1 and 2 who have metastatic breast cancer, it affects our, our treatment protocol. So patients who have BRCA-associated breast cancer in the metastatic settings, their tumors are more sensitive to platinum therapies and PARP inhibitors such as Olaparib. And then lastly, in patients with breast cancer, if they do have somatic testing, that's when you test the genetics of the tumor, if they have a somatic mutation in BRCA1 and 2, that may indicate a need for germline testing. So as I mentioned before, we do have direct-to-consumer testing with 23andMe. They offer testing of the three Jewish founder mutations, two in BRCA1 and one in BRCA2. This is not complete testing for these genes since it does not involve full gene sequencing or rearrangement testing. So I mention this because if an individual is at risk, I think it's better to come in and have a clinical evaluation and consider more comprehensive testing. We have a couple ongoing studies looking at um, testing individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry regardless of family history. The before study is now open, and for individuals who are of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, one in 40 seem to have a pathogenic mutation in BRCA1 and 2. And so the before study is a way for patients um, who want to have testing to get it done. You can go to this website, sign up, and it is being offered here in the Boston area. And this allows patients to have testing outside of a clinical consultation. So current trends in cancer testing in 2019 include that we're offering more panel testing. This is opposed to just doing a single gene test or a single site testing. And then with the panels, we now have large cancer gene panels. So Invitae has a multi-gene cancer panel with up to 83 genes. The other thing that is happening is the cost of testing has come down. Insurers are also offering um, more coverage for testing because there's more clinical indications that we should probably test a broader population. But with the cost of testing coming down, I think that's influencing um, who we are able to test. So Color Genomics has a comprehensive BRCA1-2 test that's only $50 for first-degree relatives of someone with a germline BRCA mutation. AMBRI is also offering RNA testing in addition to DNA testing. So for example, if we have a family that definitely looks like they have a hereditary cancer syndrome, we can test the DNA and it may be negative, and then we may see actually a mutation in the RNA. So if you remember, so the DNA is translated to RNA that's then transcribed to a protein. So if you have an abnormality in the DNA, that will create an abnormal protein. But if you have an abnormality in the RNA, that will also create an abnormal protein. So if you have normal DNA but a mutation in the RNA, it could result in a um, hereditary cancer syndrome. 
So we're now actually in select families doing RNA testing if the DNA testing is negative. So if you do end up going to have a consultation and have germline genetic testing, there's a couple different result possibilities. You can have a positive result, which means there's a pathogenic or deleterious mutation in a cancer gene that's associated with an increased risk for cancer. You can have a <laughs> negative result, which means it's benign, so there could be a detected alteration in DNA that's not associated with an increased risk of cancer. Or there could be an alteration that's known as a variant of undetermined significance. This is called a VUS. And that means that there's an alteration in the DNA, but we don't know yet if it's associated with cancer or not. And so VUSs, we follow with time. The testing companies give us updates on whether those VUSs are reclassified as either pathogenic or benign. And most are reclassified as benign within five years. So I do tell patients that. We do look closely at the VUS um, with patients, and when patients come for follow-up every couple years, um, we have databases that we can check to see what the status is of a VUS. So with these hereditary cancer genes, what we do depends on the gene. So there's high penetrant genes like BRCA1 and 2, where the lifetime risk of breast cancer is anywhere between 50 and 85 percent. But we also have moderate penetrant genes, where there's an increased risk of breast cancer, but it's not as high as BRCA1 and 2, and that includes ATM, CHECK2, NBN, NF1. The other high penetrant genes, in addition to BRCA1 and 2, are CDH1, PALB2, and TP53. So the average risk of breast cancer of a person's lifetime is 12 percent. We consider a person to be high risk if their risk is greater than 20 percent. But high penetrant genes is really a risk kind of above 40 percent, okay? And so, you know, there's a lot of questions about what we do in the clinical practice, and it kind of depends on the patient, and it depends on the gene. So we don't recommend screening um, for all patients the same way if they have a cancer genetic syndrome. So I want to use BRCA as an example, both to talk a little bit more about cancer risk screening and risk reduction. <laughs> so with BRCA1 and 2, the lifetime risk of breast cancer is between 50 and 85 percent in comparison to the general population, 12 percent. I think I said that before. With ovarian cancer, the risk is 20 to 40 percent with BRCA1, and the risk is 10 to 20 percent over a course of a lifetime with BRCA2. For both men and women with a BRCA mutation, there's an increased risk for pancreatic cancer, and this is something that's an ongoing area of interest, and we currently are including patients in a pancreatic cancer screening protocol looking to see whether pancreatic screening is appropriate for this patient population. For men with BRCA, they are also at an increased risk for male breast cancer, prostate cancer, and as I said before, pancreatic cancer. Both men and women are at increased risk for skin cancer, and so we do recommend for our patients to have skin evaluations once a year. So for women with BRCA, we do clinical breast exams every six months, beginning at the age of 25. We do breast MRIs every year, beginning at age 25, mammograms every year, starting at age 30, and we recommend risk-reducing ophorectomies and fallopian tube removals between age 35 and 45 after a woman has completed her family. And in this context, we do often feel very comfortable giving hormone replacement therapy because removing the ovaries at a young age induces early menopause. So for men who have BRCA, we do clinical breast exams every year starting at age 35, and we recommend prostate cancer screening at a younger age starting at age 40. For both men and women, they should have skin checks with a dermatologist annually. And then for men and women with a family history of pancreatic cancer, we do pancreatic cancer screening either on our CAPS-5 research protocol or off of it. And so that's something that can always be discussed with um, a clinical provider in our group. The other thing that we always talk about when we see patients in the cancer genetic syndrome is how their risk changes with age. We have this great tool called Ask to Me. 
and this is just an example of how we use it, and it basically will show and model a patient's risk considering the latest data in the, in the research. It will model a patient's risk depending on their age. And so this can aid in decision making, particularly if a woman is considering having a prophylactic surgery. And so as you can see, for a 35-year-old woman with a BRCA1 mutation, the, the risk at age 40 is only 7.4 percent, but that risk increases um, in the 50s and the 60s. And so these are charts showing both the breast cancer risk and then the ovarian cancer risk with age. So if you're interested in cancer genetic testing, we are available. This is our website, DanaFarber.org, Cancer Genetics and Prevention. So reach out and contact us. If you have any family or friends who are interested in testing, um, have them just reach out and contact us. If you do end up making an appointment for cancer genetic testing, we um, work very closely with genetic counselors. This is Huma Rana, one of our geneticists. And so what typically happens, patients will come into the clinic they'll first meet with a genetic counselor on that new patient visit, and then they'll see a physician after that. We have um, a large group in the Center of Cancer Genetics and Prevention. Judy Garber, who's here today, is um, our lead, and um, the group is growing, so um, we work as a team. And this slide is actually from Judy. So I want to just summarize about genetic testing pros and cons. So benefits include that it can end uncertainty about an individual's risk. It can clarify cancer risks for both an individual, but also it can be informative for their family. It can influence cancer screening and prevention recommendations and aid in medical decision making. And it may also help to relieve anxiety or worry about an individual's cancer risk. Kind of the cons or downsides to genetic testing is negative results may be uninformative or maybe they'll be falsely reassuring. So sometimes we see families who definitely seem like there's a cancer genetic syndrome, but we do testing and the testing is negative. We know a lot about cancer genes, but we're going to learn more, e even more in the future. And so even if a patient um, has negative testing results, if there's something that we're worried about in the family, we will follow um, those patients long-term in the clinic. Also, um, being identified with a cancer genetic syndrome, particularly if you're the first one in a family, can complicate family dynamics. Um, and that can be something that can be challenging for patients or families, just to be the point person that was first identified with a cancer genetic syndrome, particularly I think a young woman who has to, you know, share this information with her parents, that can be difficult. And then there's always concerns about um, discrimination. And so we have the Affordable Care Act that protects against discrimination for a pre-existing condition. However, we don't have something equivalent to protect against life insurance. So for some patients, if they're thinking about signing up for life insurance, it may make sense to sign up for life insurance and then have, have testing. <laughs> um, so patients may prefer also not to know their genetic status, both um, because that may raise their anxiety or worry, and that's fine too. But I do think everyone who may be at risk should at least come in and talk about the options. So in conclusion, I just want to thank everyone. I um, just joined Twitter, so I'm going to put a plug. I have like maybe three followers at this point, which is mainly family members. So I'm hoping in the future to um, post about um, cancer genetics, particularly when I attend conferences. So if you want to follow me, um, you can follow me on Twitter.